You are about to embark upon the great crusade. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Welcome back to the Army Flashcards Ranger School podcast. This is the final episode and final chapter of the Ranger Handbook, Chapter 15, First Aid. So it has been a long, mostly fun journey going through the Ranger Handbook with you. I appreciate all of you who have stuck with it to the end. I think you hopefully will get a lot out of it uh, and that you'll know the Ranger Handbook. I mean, really inside and out, you've heard every word of the Ranger Handbook. Sometimes we overcomplicate it and like kind of Hold it on a pedestal, but really it's just a book and honestly not that complicated. So a good job on you for listening through it. And I hope uh, after finishing this chapter, I hope you go on to do great things. And hey, hopefully some of you graduate from Ranger School here soon. So with that, let's begin the final chapter. Chapter 15, First Aid. Patrolling, more than some other types of missions, puts Rangers in harm's way. Kazovac planning is vital. Trained medical personnel might be unavailable at the initial point of injury. So all rangers know how to diagnose and treat injuries, wounds, and common illnesses. The unit should also have a plan for handling KIAs. Life-saving steps and care under fire. 15-1. Whatever the injury, 1. Stop life-threatening bleeding. 2. Open the airway and restore breathing. 3. Stop the bleeding and protect the wound. 4. Recheck, treat, and monitor for shock. And 5. Medevac the casualty. The 9-line medevac request and the casualty feeder card can be found in Appendix B. 15-2. 15-2. When still under fire, 1. Maintain situational awareness. 2. Return fire. Determine if the casualty is dead or alive. Have the casualty render self-aid. 3. Protect the casualty. 4. Move the casualty to cover. And 5. Identify and control severe bleeding with a bandage or tourniquet. Make sure any sensitive equipment is secured. While conducting the primary survey, use Table 15-1 as a step-by-step process. Table 15-1. ABCs of first aid. Airway. Open airway by patient position or with airway adjuncts. Switch A and C. Breathing. Identify and seal open chest wounds with occlusive dressing. Circulation. Identify uncontrolled bleeding and controlled pressure or tourniquet. Start intravenous therapy if needed. Disability. Determine level of consciousness. Exposure. Fully exposed patient. Environment dependent. Airway management. 15-3. The airway is usually obstructed, blocked, at the base of the tongue. If this happens, open the airway using the chin lift method for non-traumatic injuries to the face or skull. See figure 15-1 on page 15-2. For traumatic injuries, keep the airway open by using the jaw thrust method. 15-4. Remove debris, teeth, blood clots, bone from the oral cavity. Use suction if available. And place airway adjuncts to allow the victim to breathe through their nose. See figure 15-2. Or mouth. See figure 15-3 on page 15-4. Stabilizing, breathing, bleeding, and shock. 15-5. If the patient is having trouble breathing, expose the chest and identify open chest injuries. Check for entrance and exit wounds. Apply an occlusive dressing to seal open entry and exit chest wounds. Place the patient on the injured side or position him where he can breathe most comfortably. 15-6. Quickly identify and control bleeding. Apply a tourniquet to arterial bleeding of the extremities 2 to 3 inches above the elbow or knee. If this does not control the bleeding, apply a second tourniquet above the first and apply a pressure dressing. Control all other bleeding with a pressure dressing. Check dressings often to ensure bleeding is under control. 15-7. Shock is caused by an inadequate flow of oxygen to body tissues. The most common form of shock is hemorrhagic due to uncontrolled bleeding. Signs and symptoms of shock include sweaty but cool, clammy skin, pale skin, restlessness, nervousness, agitation, unusual thirst, altered mental status, rapid breathing, blotchy bluish skin around the mouth, and nausea. Basic treatment for shock is control bleeding, open airway, restore breathing, position the casualty, monitor condition, and evaluate the casualty. Injuries and burns, 15-8. For extremity injuries, identify and control the bleeding. If a fracture is suspected, splint the bone as it lies. Do not reposition the injured extremity. Check the distal pulse to make sure that there is still adequate blood flow after splinting. If there is no pulse, redo the splint and reassess. 15-9. Identify and control the bleeding of abdominal injuries and then treat for shock. 
If internal organs are exposed, cover them with dry, sterile dressing. Do not place them back in the abdominal cavity. Place the patient in a comfortable position. Flex knees to relax the abdomen. Do not give anything by mouth to the patient. 15-10. For burn patients, remove them from the source. Remove all clothing and jewelry from the areas of the body with burns. Cover burns with dry, sterile dressings. Ensure fingers and toes have dressings between them before covering the entire area. Immediately evacuate any casualties with burns of the face, neck, hands, genitalia, or over 20%, one-fifth of the body surface. See figure 15-4 on page 15-6. Treating injuries, 15-11. Rangers pay close attention to weather temperatures and the environment to avoid injuries. Hot and cold weather injuries can be mild to life-threatening. Environmental injuries range from bites and stings to accidental exposure to poisonous plants. 15-12. Knowing the signs and symptoms and the proper treatment is crucial. Tables 15-2, 15-3 on page 15-8, and 15-4 on page 15-9 detail the hot, cold, and environmental injuries that can afflict a ranger and the first aid steps for recovery. Table 15-2, Heat Injuries Injury, heat cramp, signs or symptoms. Casualty experiences muscle cramps in the arms, legs, or stomach. May also have wet skin and extreme thirst. First aid, 1. Move the casualty to a shaded area and loosen clothing. 2. Allow casualty to drink one quart of cool water slowly every hour. 3. Monitor casualty and provide water as needed. 4. Seek medical attention if cramps persist. Injury. Heat exhaustion. Signs or symptoms. Casualty experiences loss of appetite, headache, excessive sweating, weakness or faintness, dizziness, nausea, or muscle cramps. The skin is moist, pale, and clammy. First aid. 1. Move the casualty to a cool, shaded area and loosen clothing. 2. Pour water on casualty and fan to increase cooling effect of evaporation. 3. Provide at least one quart of water to replace lost fluids. 4. Elevate legs. 5. Seek medical aid. Injury. Heat stroke or sunstroke. Signs or symptoms. Casualty stops sweating, hot, dry skin. May experience headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, rapid pulse and respiration, seizures, mental confusion. Casualty may suddenly collapse and lose consciousness. First aid. 1. Move casualty to a cool, shaded area, loosen clothing, and remove outer clothing if the situation permits. 2. Immerse in cool water. If cool bath is not available, pour cool water on the head and body. Fan casualty to increase the cooling effect of evaporation. 3. If conscious, slowly consume one quart of water. Danger. Sunstroke is a medical emergency. Seek medical aid and evacuate as soon as possible. Perform any life-saving measures. Table 15-3. Cold injuries. Injury. Chillblain. Signs or symptoms. Red, swollen, hot, tender, itchy skin. Continued exposure may lead to infected, bleeding, ulcerated skin lesions. First aid. 1. Area usually responds to locally applied warming, body heat. 2. Do not rub or massage area. 3. Seek medical treatment. Injury. Immersion or trench foot. Affected parts are cold and numb. As body parts warm, they become hot, with burning and shooting pains. Advanced stage. Skin is pale with bluish cast. Pulse decreases, blistering and swelling occur. Swelling, heat hemorrhages, and gangrene may follow. First aid. 1. Gradual warming by exposure to warm air. 2. Do not massage or moisten skin. 3. Protect affected parts from trauma. 4. Dry feet thoroughly and avoid walking. 5. Seek medical treatment. Injury. Frostbite. Signs or symptoms. Superficial. Redness. Blisters in 24 to 36 hours, followed by peeling skin. Deep. Preceded by superficial frostbite. Skin is painless, pale yellowish, waxy, wooden, or solid to the touch. Blisters form in 12 to 36 hours. First aid. Superficial. Keep casualty warm and gently warm affected parts. 2. Decrease constricting clothing. Increase exercise and insulation. Deep. 1. Protect the part from additional injury. 2. Seek medical treatment as fast as possible. Injury. Snow blindness. Signs or symptoms. Red, scratchy, or watery eyes. Headache. Increase pain in eyes with exposure to light. First aid. 1. Cover the eyes with a dark cloth. 2. Seek medical treatment. Injury. Dehydration. Signs or symptoms. Similar to heat exhaustion. First aid. 1. Keep warm and loose in clothes. 2. Replace lost fluids, rest, and seek additional medical treatment. Injury. Hypothermia. Signs or symptoms. Casualty is cold, shivers uncontrollably until shivering stops. A core rectal temperature below 95 degrees Fahrenheit can affect consciousness. Uncoordinated movements, shock, and coma may occur as body temperatures drop. First aid. Mild hypothermia. 1. Warm body evenly and without delay. Provide a heat source. 2. Keep dry, protect from elements. 3. Warm liquids may be given only to a conscious casualty. 4. Be prepared to start CPR. 
5. Seek medical treatment immediately. Severe hypothermia. 1. Quickly stabilize body temperature. 2. Attempt to prevent further heat loss. 3. Handle the casualty gently. 4. Evacuate to nearest medical treatment facility as soon as possible. Table 15-4. Environmental injuries. Type. Snake bite. First aid. 1. Get the casualty away from the snake. 2. Remove all rings and bracelets from the affected extremity. 3. Reassure the casualty and keep them quiet. 4. Apply constricting bands 2-3 to three inches above the bite. 5. Immobilize the affected limb below the level of the heart. 6. Treat for shock and monitor. 7. Kill the snake without damaging its head or endangering yourself if possible and send it with the casualty. Evacuate and seek medical treatment immediately. Type. Brown recluse or black widow spider bite. First aid. 1. Keep the casualty calm. 2. Wash the area. 3. Apply ice or a freeze pack if available. 4. Seek medical treatment. Type. Tarantula bite, scorpion stinger, ant bite. First aid. 1. Wash the area. 2. If the site of bites or stings is on the face, neck, possible airway blockage, or genital area, or if the reaction is severe, or it was a dangerous southwestern scorpion sting, keep the casualty as quiet as possible, administer an antidote if needed, and seek immediate medical aid. Type. Wasp or bee stain. First aid. If the stinger is present, remove by scraping with a knife or fingernail. Do not squeeze venom sac on stinger. More venom may be injected. 2. Wash the area. 3. Apply ice or freeze pack if available. 4. If allergic signs or symptoms appear, be prepared to administer an antidote and seek medical assistance. Type. Human or animal bites. First aid. 1. Cleanse the wound thoroughly with soap or detergent solution. 2. Flush bite well with water. 3. Cover bite with sterile dressing. 4. Immobilize injured extremity. 5. Transport casualty to a medical treatment facility. 6. For human bites, try to extract some of the attacker's saliva from the wound and send that in a sealed, identified container with a casualty. 7. For animal bites, kill the animal without endangering yourself or damaging the animal's head and send its head with a casualty. Type. Poison ivy, oak, or sumac. First aid. 1. Gently clean affected area 2-3 to three times daily. Wash clothing. 2. Apply topical anti-itch lotion or ointment as needed and cover. 3. Avoid scratching the area. 4. Observe for signs of infection, increasing redness, tenderness, warm to the touch. 5. Seek medical attention if needed. Poisonous plant identification. 15-13. Poison plants include, among others, poison ivy, oak, and sumac, and stinging nettles, which is not discussed here. See figure 15-5. Poison ivy grows as a vine or shrub. The compound leaves of poison ivy have three pointed leaflets. The middle one has a much longer mini stalk than the other two side ones. The leaflet edges can be smooth or toothed, but are rarely lobed. Lobed leaves look something like a hand with fingers. The leaves vary greatly in size, from one third inch to just over two inches long. In the spring, the leaves appear reddish. They turn green in the summer, and then red, orange, and yellow in the fall. Small greenish flowers grow in bunches right where the leaf joints the main stem. The flowers are later replaced by clusters of poisonous white, waxy, plump, droopy fruit. 15-14. Poison oak is a widespread deciduous shrub throughout mountains and valleys in North America, generally below 5,000 feet elevation. It commonly grows as a climbing vine with airy roots that cling to the trunks of oaks and sycamores. Poison oak can also form dense thickets. Leaves typically have three leaflets, sometimes five, with the terminal one on a slender mini stalk as opposed to eastern poison ivy, whose terminal leaf is often on a longer mini stalk, with leaves that tend to be less ragged and serrated, less oak-like, like many members of the sumac family, new foliage and autumn leaves often turn brilliant shades of pink and red. 15-15. Poison sumac is a woody perennial shrub or small tree. It grows from 5 to 25 feet tall and favors swampy areas. To identify it, look for the fruit that grows between the leaf and the branch. Look for red stems that stay red all year. Leaves grow adjacent to each other and grow in odd numbers, totaling 5 to 13 on each stem. They have a glossy, waxy look and turn bright red and orange during the fall. 15-16. Throughout the phases of ranger school, students will encounter these poisonous plants. The rash is caused by contact with a sticky oil called urushiol, found in poison ivy, oak, or sumac. You can get the rash by touching or brushing against any part of these plants, including the leaves, stems, flowers, berries, and roots, even if the plant is dead. The rash is only spread through the oils. You cannot catch a rash from someone else by touching the blister fluid. Note, knowing the proper procedure and methods to employ a litter can save a fellow ranger's life. See chapter 9 for more information. Foot care, hydration, and acclimatization. 15-17. Use moleskin to prevent blisters prior to a movement or foot march. Keep feet as clean and dry as possible. Use foot powder and change socks. Let feet air dry as mission permits. With blisters, seek medical help if needed or if infected. 15-18.
Minimizing dehydration and increasing acclimatization is crucial for maintaining good health. There are various practices to help the ranger improve in these aspects. Table 15-5 shows some strategies. Table 15-5, Hydration Management and Acclimatization. Strategy, start early. Suggestions for implementation. 1. Start at least one month prior to school. 2. Be flexible and patient. Performance benefits take longer than physiological benefits. Strategy. Mimic the training environment climate. Suggestions for implementation. 1. In warm climates, acclimatize in the heat of day. 2. In temperate climates, work out in a warm room wearing sweats. Strategy. Ensure adequate heat stress. Suggestions for implementation. 1. Induce sweating. 2. Work up to 100 minutes of continuous physical exercise in the heat. Be patient. The first few days, it may not be possible to go the full 100 minutes without resting. 3. Once exercising for 100 minutes in the heat is comfortable, continue doing so for 7 days. Work up to at least 14 days and increase the exercise intensity each day. Loads or training runs. Strategy. Learn to drink and eat. Suggestions for implementation. 1. The thirst mechanism improves as the body becomes acclimatized to the heat. Do not wait until feeling thirst to drink water as this can actually cause dehydration. 2. Acclimatizing to heat increases personal water requirements. 3. Dehydration offsets most benefits of physical fitness and heat acclimatization. 4. More electrolytes leave the body through sweating during the first week of heat acclimatization, so add salt to food or drink electrolyte solutions. 5. A convenient way to learn how much water is needed to replace lost fluids is weighing yourself before and after the 100 minutes of exercise in the heat. For each pound loss, drink about one half of a quart of fluid. For example, if the weight loss is 8 pounds, 8 half quarts equals 4 quarts, or 1 gallon of fluid. 6. Do not skip meals, as this is when most of the water and salt losses are naturally replaced. Work, rest, and water consumption. 15-19. It is very important for rangers to adhere to proper work, rest, and water consumption schedule whenever possible. Table 15-6 provides a work, rest, and water consumption guide. This guidance applies to an average size, heat acclimated ranger wearing the Army combat uniform. 15-20. The work and rest times and fluid replacement volumes shown help the ranger sustain work performance and hydration for at least 4 hours in the specified heat category. Fluid needs can vary based on individual differences, give or take 1 quart every hour. 15-21. In Table 15-6, NL means there is no limit to work time every hour. Rest means minimal physical activity such as sitting or standing, preferably in the shade. Consume no more than 1.5 quarts of fluid every hour and no more than 12 quarts every day. If we're in body armor in a humid climate, add 5 degrees Fahrenheit to the wet bulb globe temperature. If we're in mission-oriented protective posture, or MOP4 clothing, add 10 degrees Fahrenheit to the wet bulb globe temperature. Work categories include easy, moderate, and hard. Easy work includes maintaining weapons, walking on hard surfaces at 2.5 miles per hour with a load of no more than 30 pounds, participating in marksmanship training, and participating in drills and ceremonies. Moderate work includes walking in loose sand at 2.5 miles an hour or with no load, walking on a hard surface at 3.5 miles per hour with a load weighing no more than 40 pounds, performing calisthenics, patrolling, or conducting individual movement techniques such as a lower high crawl. Hard work includes walking on a hard surface at 3.5 miles per hour with a load weighing 40 or more pounds, walking in loose sand at 2.5 miles per hour while carrying a load, and conducting field assaults. Table 15-6. Work, Rest, and Water Consumption Guidelines. Heat Category 1. Wet Bulb Globe Temperature Index in Degrees Fahrenheit, 78 to 81.9. Easy Work, Work Rest, No Limit. Water Intake, Half a Quart Per Hour. Moderate Work, Work Rest, No Limit. Water Intake, 0.75 0.75 quarts per hour. And hard work, work rest, 40-20, water intake, 0.75 quarts per hour. Heat category 2, green. Wet bulb globe temperature index in degrees, 82 to 84.9 degrees. Easy work, work rest, no limit, water intake, half a quart per hour. Moderate work, work rest, 50-10, water intake, 0.75 quarts per hour. And for hard work, 30 30 for work rest and one quart per hour water intake. Heat category three yellow, wet bulb globe temperature index in degrees Fahrenheit 85 to 87.9 degrees. Easy work, work rest, no limit. Water intake 0.75 quarts per hour. Moderate work, work rest 40 20. Water intake 0.75 quarts per hour. And for hard work, work rest 30 30 and water intake one quart per hour. Heat category 4, red, wet bulb globe temperature index in degrees, 
88 to 89.9. Easy work, work rest, no limit. Water intake, 0.75 quarts per hour. Moderate work, work rest, 30-30, 0.75 quarts per hour. And for hard work, work rest, 20-40, 1 quart per hour. And then heat category 5, black. Whip bulb globe temperature index in degrees, 90 degrees or more. Easy work, work rest, 50-10. Water intake, 1 quart per hour. For moderate work, work rest, 20-40, 1 quart per hour. And for hard work, 10-50, water intake, 1 per hour. Requesting medical evacuation, 15-22. Due to the nature of their work, at some point rangers will request a medical evacuation. This is done by following a well-rehearsed task and completing a nine-line medevac request. Additional information is required to ensure the best possible treatment of patients using a report based on the mechanism of injury, injury sustained, signs and symptoms, and treatment given or missed. This information is sent as soon as possible after the nine-line medevac request has been sent. Medevac missions should not be delayed while waiting for the missed information. 15-23 15-23. An explanation of the filled out NATO 9-line request with missed report is in Appendix B on page B6. An example of a tactical combat casualty care card is in Appendix B on pages B10 and B11. The information on the TCCC is used for the missed report. End Chapter 15. Alright, that concludes the Ranger Handbook. Good job, congratulations. From here on out, you may be asking what's next. For me, as I get more time, I actually want to go back through the Ranger Handbook and add commentary to this audiobook. So to help contextualize some of the stuff, even just reading the Ranger Handbook without the experience of conducting these operations, a lot of it doesn't really make sense unless you put it uh, in some kind of context and you know have discussions about best practices. So I don't know when it's going to be, but I will go through back through the Ranger Handbook at some point. And I will have an updated version of this podcast with uh, commentary on the various sections. Probably focus in mostly on the uh, the patrolling and some of the more tactical things. But keep your eyes and ears open for that. I also recently uh, started working on some on a video series on YouTube covering like Met TC, the troop lane procedures. So I will probably continue working on that. May start a new podcast covering those topics in more detail. Uh, really, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. If you would like to hear more from the Army Flashcards podcast, uh, shoot me a note or a comment. You go to my website, submit a message on there. Just let me know what you'd be interested in hearing on a, a new podcast, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if any of you have listened to this whole podcast and you're going to Ranger School anytime soon, shoot me a note on my website, uh, and I'll definitely send you a free gift to help you out. And last note, if you enjoyed this podcast or you think it was very helpful to you, I would really appreciate you know a visit to Army Flashcards, check out some of our products on there, uh, and maybe if you're feeling generous, buy one of the decks on there. They're very useful. I think you'll get use out of them. But Army Flashcards is a one-man business. I've started it on the side while I'm active duty, and honestly, it's my goal to step out of the Army uh, and just work on this and run this company. Uh, so I'd appreciate your support, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Take care. <laughs>